prophet Joel writes starting in verse 25 and he's speaking for the Lord. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the crawling locust, the consuming locust, and the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. You may be seated. One of the most blessed and one of the most hope-giving and one of the most joyful realization for believers is that the God that we serve is the God of restoration. He's not only the God of restoration, he's the God who promises restoration and is also able to deliver. Sometimes the circumstances in our life as the years go by can have us backing down, can have us backing off of what we once thought was possible in the Lord. On account of tough trials and lost opportunities, we can begin to count certain things as being out in our lives. It's the thinking that says, oh well, that boat has already sailed. But it's wonderful to know that we can always go and we can always call on the God of restoration. You can always count on his great plan for your life. For the believer, the best is always yet to come. And I want us to remember too this morning that our view of things can oftentimes be short-sighted, whereas God looks at things in the long term. As a matter of fact, when God sees you, he not only sees you now, but he sees you on into eternity. He sees us seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He sees me with long black hair. <laughs> so never count out what God might want to do. I heard the story of an 85-year-old woman who was walking down the main street in her hometown. One evening when she heard a low voice say, excuse me, my lady. She looked around to see who was talking, but seeing no one, she shrugged it off and she continued to walk. But she didn't get another five steps before she heard that same voice, only a little louder this time, saying, excuse me, my lady. She once again looked around and didn't see a single soul. But as she went to take another step, she looked down and she saw the cutest little frog sitting at her feet. The frog said to her, could you please help me? The elderly woman was shocked at first, but then picked up the cute little creature and asked him what he needed. The frog proceeded to tell the woman that he was actually a handsome young prince <laughs> and that he had been turned into a frog. And all the lady needed to do was give the frog a kiss and he would turn back into a handsome prince and he would be eternally grateful to her. Well, the woman thought for a moment, thought a little longer, and then she slipped the little frog into her purse. And as she walked away, she was heard to say, at my, day, at my age, I'll have more fun with the talking frog. <laughs> that makes me wonder how many things we may have crossed off in our lives that God is still after to do. In the days of the prophet Joel, God's people faced such an overwhelming obstacle in their lives. Such a tremendous hardship. I'm sure that it had all of them feeling, all of them thinking, and all of them saying, all is lost. Our plans are gone. Life will never be good again. Ever felt that way? Maybe there's some area in your life where you're feeling that way this morning. And these verses tell us exactly, literally, what had been bugging them so badly. And it was a plague of grasshoppers. Now, we may think of something cute and adorable when we think of a grasshopper. We may even think of a creature like Jiminy Cricket. By the way, is Jiminy Cricket a cricket or a grasshopper? He seems to be a perfect combo of the two. 
In any case, we're speaking here of almost total devastation. All the fruit trees were gone in the land. All the olive trees, gone. All the crops, gone. All the fields, gone. All the vineyards, gone. As though they had never been planted at all. Things had gone so far, a can of raid wouldn't have helped. <laughs> Neither would a can of black flag, and the orchid man was nowhere to be found. The locusts had brought near total devastation. There's one Old Testament scholar, Charles Feinberg, and he writes the following. Locusts have been known to devour every green herb and every blade of grass in an area of almost 90 square mile. So that the ground gave the appearance of having been scorched by fire. Locusts would even eat the bark off of trees, killing the trees. It amazes me the damage that one little bug can do. But of course then, living in Southern California, we're familiar with the little termite. <laughs> the troubles he can cause and the cost that he can incur. Such things put me in remembrance of the words of Jesus. He said in Matthew 6, 19 and 20, Don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust eat them and destroy them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven, where moth and rust cannot destroy, and thieves do not break in and steal. Job describes the total devastation that occurred in the area of Jerusalem. In verse 4, he says, What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust had eaten. What the swarming locusts left, the crawling locusts had eaten. What the crawling locusts left, the consuming locusts had eaten. The picture here is clear. This is like waves of devastation that had come upon the land. This was the condition of the land of Judah in the days of the prophet Joel. And interestingly enough, this same picture can be resembled in somebody's spiritual life. It can look as though there's no life left. It can look as though things are dead. It's a phenomena that can occur in a person's heart and life. We can feel that we're under attack. We can feel like we're in a drought. Life has left us hurt with no hope of restoration. Like Judah, something is bugging us. Something has been eating away at our faith or our joy or our innocence or the innocence of our children. True peace seems to be a thing of the past. Life's locusts have left us high and dry. Maybe it's a wrecked relationship, a marriage that's on the rocks, something gnawing at us, something that has chewed up perhaps our reputation. The picture given again is pretty dire. Chewing locusts, swarming locusts, crawling locusts, consuming locusts. It may surprise you, but there are times when God can bring locusts into our lives. He allows trials. He allows testings. And that was certainly the case in Joel's day. In verse 25, God calls them, my army. The trouble that the nation had experienced was this. It was a wake-up call. Anybody ever had locusts fly into your life and you knew it was a wake-up call? Where God says, this is it, not another step. You stop right there and I'm going to stop you. Praise God for when he does that. You know, I think when I was younger in my Christian walk, I always wanted to hear yes from God. I used to beg God for yeses. Lord, here's my prayer, say yes. But now that I'm older, I have come to love the no's of God. Thank you, Father. I'll stop right here. Thank you for that no, Lord, and not letting me go and do this thing or that thing. You are good, God. I'm going to trust you all the more. The nation had experienced a wake-up call. Trials teach us vital lessons, and God uses trials and testings in order to stretch our faith, in order to grow our faith, your being tested may very well be the answer to your prayer. 
Didn't you pray, God, I want you to use me? Haven't you prayed, God, I want you to take my life and shape it the way you want it to be? <laughs> the Lord may say, yes, so I'm going to start by knocking this off and knocking that off. Oh, Lord. <laughs> but God uses these things in our lives, not to hurt us, but to bless us. While other locusts in our lives are the resort, result of what you might call, or what I would call, the ordinary living in a fallen world. Things like persecution, abuse, disease, spiritual attack are all the aftermath of Adam's sin, of sin coming into the world. All these evils are still with us today and we cannot escape them. But God uses the evil to teach us to greater and greater trust and reliance upon him. You see, through faith, we learn to do battle. And we learn to overcome the locusts in our life. You may also notice that some locusts seem to just swarm out of nowhere. How did that happen? Well, where did that come from? I never expected that, are things we might say. There's just no good explanation for some of the locusts that come into our life. The reason seems to be hidden from our eyes. Surely God has his reason. For instance, in the account of the suffering of Job, which is studying on Wednesday. However, God does not always communicate these reasons to us. Faith does not always get a reason. It reminds me of the uh, guy who went to visit his new friend. The doorbell rang, the friend opened the door to his house, and in he walked, and what followed him was a huge black dog. The two friends began to talk, and the dog went on a rampage. He knocked over the lamp, jumped on the sofa with his muddy paws. He started gnawing on a pillow, and the visitor said nothing. Finally, the owner of the house had taken all he could take, and he said to his new buddy, Hey, friend, you need to control your dog. Look at the mess that he's making of my house. His friend looked at him with a puzzled expression on his face. What do you mean, my dog? I thought he was your dog. <laughs> the dog was neither man's fault. <laughs> Sometimes things come into our life unexpected. We don't know whose fault it is. We don't know where the, old, where the locusts originated from. In all those cases, listen to me, it doesn't matter why. In all those cases, it doesn't matter why. What matters is this. You trust the Lord and you trust him to restore what's been eaten or broken or taken away from you. Don't lead a life full of grudges. I mean, just in your mind right now, picture somebody who's given everything to the Lord and picture somebody who holds grudges. You see the two? <laughs> Which do you want to be? <laughs> oh, wait, I know what. Let's all sing Let It Go. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> We've had enough of that song, haven't we? <laughs> Trust the Lord to repair the damage. And he may not always do it in just the way we had imagined. And he may not always do it in just the timing we had imagined. But we trust him because you see, the old saying goes, Father knows best. Now I've got to admit that most of the time in my life, the locusts aren't coming from God, nor are they a result of evil in the world. And they aren't swarming out of nowhere. Most of the time, the locusts are my own fault. They're the result of my own poor choices in life. And, you know, I think back on my life. I'm sure everybody can. And you think back of the damage that's been done. Wasted opportunities. Blessings squandered. Perhaps hurt and pain that you may have caused yourself. Or hurt and pain that you may have caused others that you love. And more often than not, I find in those cases, the locusts belong to me. They're on account of my own sin. I can't blame anybody but myself. 
And sin always has consequences. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. You're familiar with it. It reminds me of this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. You plant corn, corn comes up. Not tomatoes or peaches. You sow into the ground, and what you sow into the ground is what comes up out of the ground. And it's the same with the ground of our lives. Just like we could be sad about poorer things we have sown into the ground of our lives, we could be thrilled over good things that we've sown into our life, knowing that good things will come up out of them. It reminds me of the tough old father farmer out on the ranch whose son was too busy sowing wild oats to be much help at home. The boy started early in life, running off to town to see what trouble he could get into, and he was good at it. Anybody here was good at getting in trouble? <laughs> One day, the hardened rancher, to make a point to his son, took a hammer and would drive a nail into the hitching post out in front of the barn every time his son broke a rule. Eventually, the boy got into serious trouble and was sentenced to prison. He served five years behind bars. But during that time, he also gave his life to Christ. And when he got out, his father wanted to show his son forgiveness. He wanted to encourage him in a brand new, fresh start. So one night, after a long talk, the two men walked out to the hitching post. And one by one, his father removed the nails. It was a powerful demonstration of forgiveness. But what brought tears to the son's eyes was the sight of the hitching post once all of the nails had been removed. The nail holes were still there. Oh, the sin had been forgiven. But the scars remained. I look at my own life. I am so thankful for the mercy of God. Are you thankful for the mercy of God? The mercy of God says this. You stand before him recognizing your guilt. And he says, I'm not going to hold your guilt against you. I will not punish you according to your deeds. I mean, wouldn't that be enough if we had a God to say that to us? I love the mercy of God. Freely, fully, he forgives. Our sins were nailed to the cross at Calvary. Oh, the nails have been removed. But on Jesus Christ, and the picture we're given of him in the book of Revelation, the scars remain on him. My scars on my Savior. Mm. Yes, we're forgiven. And you should leave your regrets. You should leave your sorrows. You should leave your troubles nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. And I have left them there. But I want you to know that it seems as though even in God's tremendous plan of restoration, God leaves just enough a reminder to let us know to never go back there again. Here's our Lord. Here's who we go to. Psalm 34, verse 8. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. And I remember Ruth Graham saying, in every pew sits a broken heart. That would mean then in every pew sits Jesus Christ. Whatever brokenness you have, God knows it. God knows it. And he's not put off by it. As a matter of fact, he saw your brokenness before time began, and that's why he sent his son, Jesus. Let me ask you today. What are your regrets? Maybe a failed marriage or a mistake you made with your kids. Parents always heard about that, don't they? Or a chance to witness for Christ and you let it slip away. Or a business opportunity you didn't have enough faith to take advantage of. Or a special prompting of God that would have deepened your faith or taught you his word 
or given you a place to serve, but you ignored it. You just let it pass by. Well, if you have a few regrets, let me share with you today a really exciting promise from God. There's hardly a more encouraging promise in all the Bible. Joel chapter 2 verse 25. God says to his people then and his people now. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust. Catch the implication. It doesn't matter where the damage came from. It doesn't matter the reason of your loss. It's irrelevant to the God of restoration. The locust might be God's trial to perfect your faith. Or the devil's plan to tempt you and knock you down. Or life in a fallen world. Or some unknown, unexpected reason. Or some past sin. But listen to me. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you belong to God. I heard recently a takeoff on that old Sunday school song, Jesus loves me, this I know. How about this? Jesus knows me, this I love. <laughs> the good shepherd is a shepherd of restoration and renewal. He knows his sheep. The word of God says he calls them and they come to him. He recognized their voice. Look at what this meant for God's people in the time of Joel. Verse 26 says the following. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you and my people shall never be put to shame. Isn't that a wonderful promise? My people shall never be put to shame. Thank you, Lord. Imagine looking over ravaged, barren fields. Then reading this verse, God promises here the impossible. In the end, they'll eat plenty and they'll be satisfied. Our God is in the restoration business. In fact, it's father and son restoration business, isn't it? <laughs> God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, they're in the restoration business. I mean, who couldn't? Who? You, in fact, look at this. You could call the Bible the uh, restoration accounts. <laughs> in fact, isn't the Bible that? <laughs> Fallen restoration. <laughs> and, then he, and then God takes one person right after another. Fallen restoration, fallen restoration, fallen restoration. The Bible lists restorations. In fact, in the end, God restores everything. All of creation, all of humanity, everything restored to him. That's who our God is. You got to understand that's foundational to his character. You got to trust that you got to let go to that. Now, uh, here's something I picked up yesterday at the men's breakfast. Beautiful illustration that John Edmiston shared with us, and I want to share it with you. There also is the understanding that God makes each one of us different. You can take a look out in the creation. God makes giraffes, and God makes hummingbirds. <laughs> but I want you to imagine for a moment... The giraffe saying, I wish I was like the hummingbird. I wish I could fly. Why can't I fly? He gets to fly. I'd like to fly too. And John said, if you have a giraffe that wants to be a hummingbird, that's a dumb giraffe. <laughs> and he says, imagine the hummingbird who says, I want to be a giraffe. I want to stand tall. I want people to notice me. I want to be able to reach right up and eat what I want. And he said, if you have a hummingbird that wants to be a giraffe, that's a dumb hummingbird. <laughs> There's a certain acceptance of what God has made us to be and how he has made us to be. And he hasn't made us to do everything. He has made us fit for what he wants to use and how he wants to use us in this world and how he wants to use us to touch other people's lives. And you just got to trust that. You got to say, okay, God, I want to be all I can be. <laughs> I want to be, Lord God. What you intended for me to be, I let go of everything else. Here's the moral to the story. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> this is the moral to the story. Whatever we may have thought was a closed door may not be a closed door. 
even after you think the door of opportunity has been slammed shut in your face, God has a way of opening up new doors. Oftentimes, better doors. And there will not be a single thing that is unrestored, I mean completely restored and made new in heaven with him in eternity. When you look at it, believer, you can't lose. You can't lose. <laughs> There's nothing in your life that won't be restored, either here or in the life to come. God wants to work in your life to restore your unwrapped, untapped potential. The thrown away opportunities, the set aside talents, the ignored gifts, the neglected calling, the abused body. He'll even make up the foolishness of your youth or the impulsiveness of your decisions. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon wrote explaining this time once passed is gone forever you cannot have back your time but there is a strange and wonderful way in which God can give back to you the wasted blessing the unripened fruit of years over which you mourned the fruit of wasted years may yet be yours put your faith in Jesus Christ Trust in and call upon the God of restoration. That's who's here today. Just humble yourself before God. You don't need some great ceremony. You can do it right now where you're sitting. Lord, I humble myself before you. There have been locusts in my life. Some relationships have been eaten away. Some things have been lost. But Lord, however you do what it is you do, come and do it. The Lord's waiting for that opportunity that you give him. Not striving after this or fighting for that, but just in simplicity. God, I'm yours. You're the God of restoration. I trust you. Come do a work in me, whatever work you want to do. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this morning, and I thank you, Father, for, for the communion that's sitting before us now. I ask, Lord God, that your blessings, blessings would remain upon us. In fact, Father, I ask that you would bless everyone here. Bless everyone who's listening. Give blessings. God of restoration, come. God of restoration, be here now. Things that we thought were lost, you could bring back to life in new and exciting ways. Lord, we don't want to cross off anything that you want to do. Come, Lord Jesus. Restore, renew. And Father, we lift up before you family members. And they need a touch of restoration in their lives. I recognize in my life that people prayed for me and God came and did restoration. Lord Jesus, do restoration in these the lives that we know and love. Maybe it's a sister. Maybe it's your mom. Maybe it's a brother or a nephew or a cousin. Lift him up before the Lord right now. God of restoration, we're calling on you to do a work. Thank you, Lord, that you hear us. Thank you, Lord. Restore, surprise us, Lord. We give you free reign. We pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Everybody says.